Um, and now it is time for another distinguished guest with us across the ocean with the help of a cutting edge technology called Teams. Our next speaker will probably seem provocative to many publishers in this room. He uh, recently made headlines with his testimony before the US Senate during the oversight of AI, the future of journalism hearing. His critique centers on American media companies for what he thinks is a fear-driven approach towards AI. As he sees it, they are missing a monumental opportunity by choosing a combative approach instead of embracing the transformative potential of AI to redefine journalism. In contrast, he admires and supports the Norwegian model uh, for what he sees as an open embrace of artificial intelligence within the field. Please welcome Professor Emeritus Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, Jeff Jarvis. I Thank you very much. Can you you give here. me a thumbs up that it's working? Everything good. Oh, good. I hate Microsoft Teams, by the way, but I'm here in spite of it. I also very much wish that I were there at the conference. Uh, Monday, I saw Amy Reinhardt from the Associated Press, who said there is no single better conference all year than yours, and it's killing me all the more that I'm not there, but I'm delighted and honored to be able to talk to you, uh, by, even by Teams. Um, uh, the summary of what I want to say was, was excellent. Uh, I did testify before the US Senate a few months ago about uh, efforts to um, control uh, the ability of AI, large language models, to read and learn from uh, the text of news and media. And I was the odd man out on the panel and the testimony because there were lobbyists and legislators who all wanted to nod their heads at each other and I was the only dissenting voice. Because I believe that in the end, we have to be concerned about trying to expand copyright and diminish fair use using AI as an excuse to do so. I'll get more into that in a minute. Uh, also, today, by the way, I just uh, this morning released a new paper that I wrote about the California Journalism Preservation Act, which is related to a federal piece of legislation, which is terrible legislation in my view. And I uh, went through discussion about how newspaper companies are trying to, again, extend copyright and diminish fair use uh, when it comes to uh, platforms linking to their news. This was a process that was started with the Leistungsschutzrecht in Germany, the Spanish link tax, the um, EU copyright directive, uh, Australia's bargaining code, and then what I see as the disastrous implementation of C-18 in Canada. Now it's occurring with uh, similar legislation in California, in Illinois, and federally in the US. So that's our, my beginning uh, uh, landscape. In the middle of all this, it so happens that I have a new podcast, because <clears throat> everybody has to have a podcast about AI, called uh, AI Inside, uh, at AIinside.show, and had the honor of interviewing, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Sven Stemmetalo from Shipstead uh, for it. And I heard a, a very different attitude from him, from Shipstead, and from the Nordics and you. <clears throat> and that was uh, when Sven said that the company didn't really see some bag of gold to be held out for to demand of the AI companies, that uh, if you dare read our content, you must pay us a fortune and save our business. Um, not so much. Uh, as Sven, I think, uh, wisely noted, uh, the content is, fu is fungible, anybody else's content would do the same job. The, the goal was not to get that bag of money. The goal instead, he said, was to get fair access to the technology. That if the, open AI, if the AI companies used their content to learn, that it would be only fair for the companies they learn from to have access to the technology. That is a strategic view about growth and possibility and collaboration. It's a much more, I think, productive and collaborative view than we have in the US. So I wanna just draw that, par that, that contrast a little more for a few minutes before going into the implications. In the US, news media are portraying themselves as the victims of technology, of the internet and now AI. Uh, the New York Times, as you know, is suing um, OpenAI. It, it insists at the beginning of its suit 
that copyright has protected news since the very beginning. That is simply not true. In the United States, uh, copyright did not protect news and magazines until 1909. The Statute of Anne, the first copyright legislation in the UK, did not protect news. Uh, in court cases in the US, courts have avoided giving news a, a sense of proper news as property. So if you look at the earliest postal legislation in the US, uh, the post office made it possible for newspapers to share newspapers among themselves for free so that they could share news stories and so that we could build a national network for news and with it a nation. With it, by the way, came a new job description called literally scissors editors, editors whose job it was to cut up other newspapers and reset the stories in their newspapers. It's something that we've done in our field forever. More importantly, there is an irony here to how news organizations approach this because we as journalists all read each other, use facts from each other, adapt and learn from each other. So when we say that we can do that with journalists and with public sources, to turn around and say that AI companies and their AI cannot read and cannot learn from this content without licensing and payment is hypocritical in my view. But this is, there's a long history of newspapers doing this in the United States. We are, our field, and I'm a newspaper journalist from long back, uh, has long been uh, inhospitable to new technologies and new competitors. Uh, a century ago now, when radio came into the United States, uh, soon thereafter, newspaper companies ganged together to force radio companies, the first two networks, to kill their news operations, force them to agree to only have two five-minute updates a day that had to be bought from the wire services owned by the newspapers. Um, they could only be, only be, I think, 30 seconds long each in that five minutes. They had to be written to encourage reading newspapers. Uh, they forbade advertising associated with news, so no money could be made from it. And they insisted on getting uh, broadcast regulated by government, an exception to our First Amendment. This has continued with television. It continued with the phone companies. Every time there is a new technology, my dear colleagues in newspapers throw up alarms that this new technology is bad for democracy and that only they can preserve democracy, otherwise it dies in darkness, and that their content should not be used. In the latest iteration, of course, we have them saying that they should be paid uh, uh, for the privilege of platforms linking to them. But the platforms, the value of the platforms links is not accounted for in any of this legislation. So that's the, um, the, the atmosphere that we have here. And it's a bit of a conspiracy across the world. It started with actual Springer and Borda in Germany with the Leistungsschutzrecht. Uh, and even though that ended up dying as legislation, it became the model for the EU copyright directive uh, and the Spanish link tax uh, and uh, Murdoch's Australian bargaining code. And then in Canada with C18, there was no opportunity for negotiation. Uh, and both Google and Meta threatened to pull news out of Canada. Google did not. It ended up paying about $75 million US, 100 million Canadian, to various publishers. Um, and that process is ongoing right now. But Meta, as you probably know, pulled all news off of Facebook and Instagram and all contributions to the news industry and basically fired everybody involved with news up there. Uh, and I've talked to some publishers in Canada who said they'd far rather have the traffic from Facebook than the money that they're going to get it's nearly impossible to imagine starting something new without that traffic. Uh, and so I think that this hostility that we see, this, this sense of entitlement and victimhood that we see in the American newspaper industry is not going to be productive. Yes, there'll probably be settlements. Yes, there'll be payments. There'll be bakshish. And what we'll end up with is a few bucks for a little while rather than having a strategic view of what AI could be for the industry. I had the privilege of listening to Felix and then the audio segment, and it was wonderful to hear just the attitude in the audio segment that yes, cautions were mentioned, uh, rules and, and principles were mentioned, but the ethos of everything I heard was about the possibilities for us and how we can take on this and control this. I'm writing a book right now about the history of the linotype, uh, a bit arcane, I admit, 
And one of the lessons that I have in that book is that the International Typographical Union could have uh, resisted the entry of the linotype, replacing them Oops, I muted myself. Um, they could have, they could have um, uh, resisted this technology. Instead, the ITU, the union, said, no, we must take charge of it. And they shrunk in jobs for a little while, but then they grew immensely with the growth in publishing. Uh, until along came uh, photo typesetting, cold type, they resisted, they killed six out of nine newspapers in New York and their union. There's a moral in here about how we should embrace and try to take charge of technology uh, and, and have a role in that. Not to plug, but I have a new book coming out in the fall right. called The Web We Weave, uh, in which I argue that it is time to demote the geeks. And for us in the humanities and communication and journalism and social sciences to take charge of the technologies and see where we go. So a few quick implications of all of this uh, for, I hope, discussion. The first is that I see news, quality news, especially in the United States, retreating everywhere behind paywalls. That's far more successful in the Nordics than it is in the US. In the US, uh, our penetration of news now is infinitesimal. It's, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so quality news is behind paywalls and that leaves the open web uh, as fair game for disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, hatred, and all kinds of awful things. We have to ask as journalists what responsibility, what moral responsibility we have to the larger news and information ecosystems of our communities. I understand the need for paywalls. I certainly understand the need for to pay journalists and my graduating students. But we have to ask in a time when fascism is rising in the United States and parts of Europe and elsewhere in the world, whether we are making the difference we should be making to the total news and information ecosystem, and that now includes AI. Do we want stupider and stupider and more ignorant and more ignorant uh, large language models out there? Now, I again, I admire what I see happening in the Nordics, where, as Sven told me, uh, Shipstead has been out there promoting the contribution of news content to uh, native language LLMs uh, so that you can learn how much better they are than the English versions and how much more appropriate they are to your cultures and nations. And that's the way to look at this. As he also explained, the business model is not yet set. That will be negotiation going forward, and that's fine. But the first reflex in the US is to lobby for protectionist legislation and regulation and to sue in court and not to learn and not to build together. So I think we need to look in our industry toward you and your strategic attitude toward technology and how to control and use and grow with it. Uh, two other quick points. One is our coverage of artificial intelligence has been, I think, fairly awful in the United States. Our coverage of the internet ever since 2016 in the election of Donald Trump flipped from utopian to dystopian because we wanted to blame somebody else and we blame the internet for that. And the moral panic that has emerged around the internet in US media, which I write about in my next book, is leading to terrible legislation that will affect the rights and freedoms of us all online. That bothers me. Now come AI, we're seeing a replay of that, but there's another angle here, which is that a lot of the AI boys, and they are boys, are influenced by the uh, faux philosophies of long-termism and effective altruism, and I'm sure you've covered those stories, but it isn't being covered enough. And I think we have to do a better job of looking at the motivations and the um, worldviews that are influencing the creation of AI and we also have to support open source AI so that large companies don't end up controlling this exclusively. And I think that uh, that's especially important in non-English speaking countries where you're gonna be left behind otherwise. There have been movements in the US as well in, in the EU to restrict open source AI and I think that's dangerous. Finally, I argue in my book that the internet is not a technology, it is a human network. And I see similarly 
that what's interesting about AI to me, and I might or may not be working on a book series on this, is that it is a reflection of humanity. Uh, what AI feeds back to us is our cliches and our language and our prejudices and misinformation and our best as well. How we react to AI in our fears and trepidation and, and hopes says much about us. How we use AI to create art or journalism or whatever we wish also says much about us. So I think we have to stop looking at these things purely as technologies and start to look at them from the aspect of the humanities and the social sciences and communication. I'm working on trying to start new degree programs at other universities in what I've been calling internet studies, but is really about the internet, AI, and the humanities. And I think that it's important for us in journalism to bring the humanity back into this discussion. So with that, I will end and hope that there is a discussion, challenge, a debate, whatever we can in the few minutes that we have before I hold you off from the end of the day. Thank you for your kind attention. I am hearing nothing on my end. Okay, and Mike coming here. Thank you, Agnes. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for the very, very interesting. Uh, speech, comment, whatever you want to call it. And um, I'm sure we have questions from the audience and at least I have a few. Because uh, first off, I just want to understand kind of your argumentation. Because if the media and the publishers were to give everything away, like kind of no boundaries, no compensation, we are more likely, you think, to end up with kind of the journalistic values you hold high and with an informed democracy? I'm not saying that we should, we must give it all away, but I am saying that much of what we have is now held behind walls. And in the US, the publishers were saying that anything that is copyrighted should not be used to learn from. Well, there's tons of copyright, everything in the US is copyrighted. So that basically cuts off all possible content, point one. Point two, I, I think we need to come up with smarter strategic relationships. Uh, Amy Reinhardt, who I mentioned earlier, is working on in her, not at the AP, but in her, in the executive program I started at CUNY, on the idea of creating a news LLM. What I also argue is that we should create a news API and we should go to the um, AI companies and say, you can get current information, you can get it packaged well for you, here's the deal, here's what you have to do to get a key in terms of payment, in terms of credit, in terms of usage. Why don't we start with that process of negotiation Instead, in the US, the view is you can have nothing unless you pay us a lot of money, and then you can have some, and that's not going to be productive. But, but as you said yourself, we don't really know what the business model will be in this, right? So this might be seen as kind of this uh, very cowboy or one might say very liberal, optimistic approach to think that the market will just fix itself somehow. But I think that the, this is where, where I think the Shipstead's attitude is right. The value of our... Uh, uh, archived content to training models is of limited economic value. There's tons of content out there. They can find content elsewhere. If they don't use ours, they'll use others to teach the models grammar and associations. So I think that we've, we've focused too quickly on this idea of training as a gold mine. It isn't. Uh, but I think that when we go forward, there is the opportunity again to say that models are stale they are inaccurate, and we can help with that, and then you pay us for that help. Okay, so, so you talk a lot about Norway, <laughs> and I was thinking uh, that maybe we should ask the room if there are any Norwegians here who would like to, to comment on uh, Jeff's... Or dissent. <laughs> yeah, I uh, have a tip that Markus Husby, head of AI at VG, maybe would like to comment. Is he here? He is over here. Do we have a microphone for Marcus? Okay, he got mine. Hello. 
Hello, thank you for the talk, uh, Jeff. Uh, uh, I think Norway does uh, a lot of great things, uh, uh, but I'm a bit jealous of uh, Denmark that is uh, going to build uh, one of the world's, uh, world's largest supercomputers with NVIDIA. So that's my comment to that. This one is, oh, your comment is that you kind of like Denmark's approach more than the Norwegian approach. Like the government approach. <laughs> yeah, okay. What do you say to that, Jeff? Have you heard of this uh, supercomputer by Novo Nordisk? I, I had not heard of that. I, I, I watched the uh, NVIDIA uh, uh, keynote a, a few weeks ago, and I have to say that it rather took my breath away then when they, they demonstrated the size of the computing power that they're going to have. And then they said, then uh, uh, the CEO said, and you have to fill all of that. I, I fear that we're getting into a kind of male macho size matters problem here around AI in terms of the machines and the size of the models. And I always recommend that people read the Stochastic Parrots paper by <laughs> Timnit Gebru and company that uh, we've got that, that, that by making models and computers larger and larger and larger, we make it more and more difficult to understand what they do and manage them. Yeah, and call it by sci-fi names like Stargate also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I was wondering, yeah, relating to size as well, but do we in the Nordic countries, um, let alone individual publishers, do we really have the size, do we have the resources to produce language models to compete with those of the giants? I don't know that you. Well, I, I think it's I think it's smart and wise to be building uh, uh, native language models, but I don't know that you necessarily need to build the models. I think if you have access to the technology, especially the open source technology, and you use that in smart ways to put it ahead of your content to create news user interfaces for it, to use it to have journalists. Um, I mean, there's tons of possible uses that I'm sure you've been talking about these last two days. Uh, I've talked to editors in the U.S. about about having citizens. Um, uh, record school board meetings across the state so we can uh, put a large language model in, atop of that data and ask what's happening there. Uh, I, I mentioned in my paper InnoCode in, in Norway, which, which tries to make uh, government data more open. I think there's a lot of ways that we can use AI that don't require us to be AI companies. Do we have anyone else in the room who would like to ask Jeff a question? Then we have a microphone that works right here. <laughs> Um, thank you for a very interesting speech. Uh, I would like you to elaborate a bit on the effective altruism and the uh, men leading the tech giants. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, happily, uh, if you would uh, Google TESCREAL, T-E-S-C-R-E-A-L, that is the acronym for the various uh, philosophies that, that came together. Timnit Gebru, to mention her again, and Emil Torres have written about this a great deal. Uh, and Emil is a very good source on this, where what they argue is that long-termism, the belief that we owe the future 10 to the 58th possible human beings, real and virtual, a debt greater than we owe the present day, puts these um, technology moguls in the position of saying, well, I'm going to build the future. I know what's best for the future. Give me the power and the money to do it. Uh, and stop me, by the way, from destroying all mankind in the process. Uh, it's tremendous tech bro ego involved. But worse than that, what these, these, these uh, philosophies really lead to, in, in, the, in the words of Emil Torres, is eugenics. Sorry, uh, I missed my dentist appointment. Um, <laughs> for you, I didn't have my teeth drilled. Uh, uh, using teams is about as bad, but I'll go on. Um, uh, so uh, their belief is that uh, they should hold this power in the future. But they also believe further that they're gonna perfect humanity. And they're going to look at how Musk, uh, Elon Musk wants to have many babies, wants to uh, populate Mars, and wants to install chips in heads. This, in the long run, is about uh, utilitarianism and eugenics. And so there's a frightening philosophy out there behind a lot, not all, but a lot of these people in the AI world. It's even worse than the crypto bros and the blockchain bros thinking that they were going to solve all problems with technology. It's worse than just technological solutionism. It's about technology taking over. And mind you, I defend the freedoms that technology has brought us in, I'll play it one more time, my new book coming out in the fall. <laughs> but I think that we have to beware 
uh, and learn the lessons that when we leave the technologists in charge. In my, sorry for the second plug, my current book, The Gutenberg Parenthesis, one thing I learned is that with any new technology, at first the technologists seem to be in charge and then they fade into the woodwork. So in the early days of print, it was the printer, the technologist, who was held responsible for what the technology did. Beheaded, behanded, burned at the stake. Then it was the industry, the intermediaries, the booksellers, the publishers. And then finally it was the author. And that, says Michel Foucault, is when we saw the birth of the author. Same thing happening today with AI. Some believe that the model should be held responsible for everything that can be done. Well, with a general machine, I think that's impossible. Then there's the intermediaries. There's the companies who use it to do things. Airlines who use chatbots to rip off customers. And then there's the authors, the people, the users, the people who use the machine. Uh, I covered the federal hearing for a lawyer in the U.S. who used ChatGPT to come up with fake uh, citations for a filing of his. And the, the judge in the end said the technology wasn't at fault at all. It was doing what it was designed to do. The fault was in the human being, the user, the author, for not doing his work. So I think we're in a pr process of negotiating power and responsibility here, as we do with any new technology. And I don't want to see us go overboard with the crazies of their philosophy, and I know I'm out of time, sorry, but you asked me. <laughs> yeah, we're almost out of time. I just have one one last question, actually, because we're talking about, you're talking about the way forward, sorry, you're here, you're talking about the way forward as kind of the <laughs> publishers negotiating with big tech, basically, about how to, how to make deals and how to move on, move forward strategically, but it can be very difficult for small publishers, as we have discussed at this summit as well. Do we need, how do, how do they leverage, how do they have the power, the smaller publishers? Do we need regulations? What do you think we need to actually achieve this? I, I, I think that's a wonderful question. I think first we need generosity from the big publishers to include the small publishers. That doesn't happen very often. The legislation that I write about today in the paper that I put out, which you can find on, on my Twitter feed, uh, the California Journalism Preservation Act, uh, specifically cuts off small publishers who earn less than $100,000 a year. It benefits the papers now owned by hedge funds. So that's a hard thing to do, but I think that the majors uh, can be generous, including the small publishers, number one. Number two, we can form associations that include not only publishers, but also members of civil society in the communities to have this discussion at a larger scale about how to build responsible AI responsibly. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, uh, then yes, there is the, the European reflex to regulation. In the US, our Congress right now uh, doesn't do anything, and if it does it, it's dangerous. So I tend not to uh, revert to that. Thank you so much, Jeff Jarvis. It felt, it felt like you were here, don't you agree? Thank you so much. Let's give him a big hand.